I'm Cher Russell for mining.com.au and joining me today is the CEO of GTI Energy, Bruce Lane. Bruce, it's fabulous to have you back on. How are you? I'm great, Che. Thanks. It's uh, good to be back with you. Uh, now, today we are having a uranium macroeconomic focus conversation. I know you've got a lot to say on the uranium market, and I'm really looking forward to today. But first of all, let's kick off with the spot price, which is actually causing disruption to long-term contracts being signed. Uh, I know there's a couple of experts in the industry have said that the spot price is too low to incentivize people to sign these long-term contracts to get these projects up off the ground. Bruce, what are you hearing? Uh, you look, I think there's there's... There's probably an element of truth in that. I think um, it does make it harder for the utilities to kind of justify locking into a, a longer term contract price at a price that is significantly higher than the spot price, despite that we all know that the spot market is very thinly traded. So it does act as a bit of a, a handbrake on things. Um, look, the rubber band is stretching, though, and you know we can see you know that the supply and demand that that big that big mismatch is starting to bite. I think the spot price is starting to move up. I, I think we were talking earlier, it's around that sort of $68 mark. Um, certainly seems to be heading in the right direction. And seasonally, this is the time of the year when there's a bit of activity. So we are expecting it to improve and move back towards that $80 um, price. Um, and look, how long it takes for it to move significantly, I don't know, but it is moving. Uh, moving forward, now I know you've got your ear to the ground of what's happening in the US. And last year there was some noise being made about data centres using nuclear energy to power those data centres. What are you hearing now? Oh, look, the, the latest um, news out of the White House, and there was a live press conference only a few moments ago with uh, the CEO of NVIDIA, Jensen Wang, um, talking, and, and President Trump spoke uh, very candidly about the need to double electricity and more supply in the US to be able to support not just the data centers and hyper hyperscalers, but all industry in the US, because I think the reality is it's going to be tech driven, this next wave of industrial um, capacity expansion in the US. They're giving uh, tax write-offs for the construction of, of new facilities, for instance. So if Jensen wants to build a new chip manufacturing or assembly facility in, in the US, he can write off the cost of doing that um, straight away. And so those incentives are all in place. Um, it's pretty clear that uh, Trump's and uh, you, very, very, very focused on energy and getting as many low cost, as clean as possible, uh, electrons onto the grid. And, and, he's re and he's released the coal mining industry uh, a couple of weeks ago um, and, and allowed projects to go forward. So, you know, to be, to be able to get those electrons up front as soon as possible. So it, it's, I think the shift is um, tectonic from where we were, say, you know, even even a year ago. Um, and it's, it's going to take people a little while to catch up um, with what's happening, but it, it really is happening. Uh, the US is going back to energy fundamentalism and, uh, and looking to just get as many electrons onto the grid as fast as they can. And nuclear is definitely a part of that. And I think the hyperscalers are looking at uh, projects where they build data centers that have their own power plants together. Somebody the other day even suggested that they build them in the Permian Basin where there's um, basically free gas um, and, uh, or, or very, very cheap gas. And, uh, and, to build, and to build a data center in that area with a gas-fired power station right next to it. So those sorts of concepts around Trump, the Trump administration are looking to approve those rapidly and get them going. And so hopefully we'll see some announcements in the not-too-distant future around uh, you know, gigawatt-scale nuclear reactors, not just small modular reactors. I just want to touch on something you said in your answer earlier, and that is uh, the mismatch of energy supply and demand in the US. Uh, tell me, how much energy is the US going to need going forward as the electrification of everything happens? And how much can nuclear fill that gap? Yeah, the, um, the projections for future demand sort of range up to a doubling of demand and beyond. And I think I touched on that before. And look, what's important there is that that's why they're trying to pull every lever in the energy space, gas, coal, you know, there'll still be some renewables, but they're not going to be on an accelerated permitting basis. They're going to 
they're going to promote nuclear coal gas, for instance, to the top of the pile to get those firm sources onto the grid as soon as possible. Nuclear is set for a tripling by 2050. Um, and look, the projections for uranium demand behind that, currently the US uses just around 50 million pounds. That sort of indicates we'd need 150 million pounds. And at the moment, the US only produces about 1 million pounds. So you can see that the upside for uranium miners is, is very, very substantial. So we're seeing um, that, that start to happen in terms of commitment to new nuclear projects at the small modular um, end in particular. But what we hope to see in the not too distant future is these gigawatt scale reactors, AP1000s, permitted for build at existing nuclear power sites and potentially behind the meter with hyperscalers. And finally, I wouldn't mind bringing this back to GTI Energy's project, the Loherma project out in Wyoming. Now, at the start of the conversation, we talked about how the current spot price is a bit of a deterrent for bringing some projects online. What's the sweet spot for your project? Uh, look, the sweet spot for our project is the highest possible uranium price, obviously. So, <laughs> um, but look, um, where we're at at $80 a pound uh, term, we're seeing... Uh, our uh, neighbours get back into business. And, and that, yes, some of those are, most of those are brownfield sites, but for instance, UR Energy is building the Shirley Basin project, which is a similar size project to our Low Herma project. And they're building it on the basis of around $82 to $86 a pound over its, uh, over its life. Now it makes plenty of money at that point. So $80 we believe is enough for our type of project, our low cost, um, low capex projects. It's a bit different to the likes of, say, uh, Bannerman or Deep Yellow's projects, which we, we can see because they're holding off on their final investment decision that they need a price north of $80. And they've, both those companies have spoken to that. So we think a lot of pounds are staying in the ground until that term price, and these things need a 10, 20, 30-year runway to be able to justify the capital. So they, they, uh, they're looking for a higher price. And John Borshoff's been very open about that. And I think Brandon Monroe has as well. So really, they need more encouragement in, this, in the term price to be able to get to FID. You know, we don't think we need that for our projects. We're, we're OK where we are. But hey, we, we definitely won't be signing any contracts at 80 bucks if they aren't. Um, so we're, we're heading towards scope and study. So we're, we're fairly early on in the process compared to the likes of those companies, but we're getting pretty close to being able to put a study out. Uh, listen, Bruce, it's always a pleasure when I speak with you. Thank you so much for being here today. Great, thanks. And thanks, Shay. I enjoyed the, the, the conversation. <laughs>